Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our next round of seminar today in the series of Genomics on Health and uh, Wellbeing. Um, so today, our speaker is Professor Shankar Narayan from CCMB, and I'd request our uh, officiating director, Professor Maitreya, to kindly introduce him. Thank you, Alpana. Uh, so we have a little, little rescheduling of a thing, uh, uh, program. We had been having fascinating discussions and interactions with him uh, since morning, and that's why this change. We, I apologize for that. Uh, so today we are really, really privileged uh, to host uh, Professor Shankaranand from CCMB for uh, his visit and his um, talk. We all look forward to the talk, so I'll not stay much in between the, his talk and, and uh, us at this point of time. So interestingly, uh, Dr. Sankar Narayanan has obtained his uh, graduation and post-graduation in physics uh, from uh, MKU, Madurai Kamraj University, a place of uh, repute and a very lovely campus because a long time back I had visited it and it was like great. And then he went on to do his PhD in uh, Molecular Biophysics Unit, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, in 1996. He went for his post-graduation, post uh, postdoctoral research abroad in Strasbourg, France. And then after returning to India, he set up a state-of-the-art macromolecular crystallography laboratory uh, in CCMB on the field of structural biology. His group has made outstanding contributions in the area of proofreading during biosynthesis. He has numerous um, you know, frontline and high impact publications to his credit. Uh, he has also a lot of awards, uh, very prominent and prestigious awards, like the Wellcome Trust International Senior Research Fellowship in 2003, Swan Janti Fellowship of the DST, uh, Na uh, National Bioscience Award of DBT, Swanti Saru Bhatnagar Award in 2011, GN Ramchandran Gold Medal 2015, and Infosys Science Prize in 2020, just to name a few. He's also an associate editor of the Journal of Structural Biology and he's on the board of being editor of the journal eLife, which is a uh, major interest. He's, of course, a fellow of the all the three national science academies of the country. And, and we are really honored and privileged to have him here today. And I thank uh, Pachuda, Professor Pachuda Mojumdar for connecting him with us and uh, facilitating this uh, his visit, which is now made possible. Dr. Sankar So a very good afternoon to all of you. And she said, sorry for making the students wait for a longer time. Hopefully we will have a discussion. Are you able to hear me at the back? It's on, it's just that. Can you hear me at the back? Maybe I'll stay, try to stay closer to the. I think this is this is not on. Or... Call on microphone. Call on microphone. Okay. Yeah. Ah, it. And it becomes easier. Yeah. yeah. Is this the one you use? For... Yeah. Okay, can you hear me at the back? Very good, excellent. So, been having wonderful discussion with people here and I should first thank uh, Parthoda and others for this kind introduction and 
think realize that it's very short visit for a campus like this. Maybe hopefully I'll try to come you know, at some other point of time and have larger interaction with all of you. So what uh, I was just thinking uh, now that I'm coming to a genomics institute right, which focuses on analyzing genomes from the perspective of uh, health, correct? biomedical relevance. I was just wondering how do I put my work on translation to you guys? So in the process, I'm trying something. I hope it works. We also use genomics information cutting across organisms. But I will see, I will try to tell you what kind of information that possibly gives us in understanding the evolution of cellular processes as we go on. So to begin with, <clears throat> Yeah, you have to stand here and speak because it's being webcast live and the camera is there. Yeah, yeah. so uh, other, otherwise uh, okay. you're not visible online. Sure, sure. <clears throat> yeah, that's fine. Is yeah. that okay? Yeah. yeah. Basically, you are freezing the speaker with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the area that we are working on is proofreading, and this proofreading is pertaining to protein biosynthesis, correct? And I will tell you what is chiral proofreading in a while and also talk about some of the evolutionary implications of the work in terms of how life forms could have emerged with the help of some of these proofreading entities. So to begin with, particularly for the students here, all of you know that the central dogma is depicted here and each of these processes are error pro correct like any biological process right the biological processes that are propagating the genomic information are also highly error pro and this is kind of known in the area so people are trying to understand why errors are happening correct what is the relevance of errors and as many of you know that if there are a lot of errors that are introduced during these processes the organisms cannot survive and very minimal errors does not allow the organisms to evolve. So there is a nice trade-off between how many errors that you actually allow. So these processes are actually fine-tuned. And over a period of last 10 years or so, the current understanding is the cell of the organism, whichever that you want to take, fine-tunes fine -tunes the errors in an environmental-specific manner in terms of helping the organism. So the larger area now which is developing is that how these proofreading mechanisms fine tune themselves in the context of their environmental niche so that it can help the organism during certain stress conditions. So that is the kind of ideas that are emerging. So as I said, uh, I'll start from in a chronological way as to how we entered this area of so-called chiral proofreading. So as you know, uh, all proteins are made of uh, slides. Yeah, so <clears throat> all these proteins are made of uh, 20 amino acids, correct? We all know that. And if you look at some of the amino acids, say for example, an amino acid like glutamic acid and compare it with phenylalanine, it's very easy for us to see that they are very different in terms of their structure and in terms of their chemistry. So the enzymes that are responsible for selecting them for protein synthesis would not have serious issues in terms of maintaining what we call as the fidelity of the genetic code. However, if you look at amino acids like isoleucine and valine, or for example, threonine and serine, they are very, very similar, correct? They are so similar that based on the simple biochemical or chemical way of identifying or selecting these amino acids by these enzymes would not give the biological fidelity that is required. So this was something which was puzzling and the problem was first posed by none other than Linus Pauling way back in the 50s. And the beauty of that proposition or the idea of proofreading came from him. And the beauty is that at that time, there was no protein structures available, correct? The structural idea of how proteins would look like 
was not there. But even there, he could just by using the simple chemical principles suggest that for proteins to work in a biological system or protein synthesis to work with in a highly, in a highly fiddle manner, you need to have proofreading that has to happen. He had no idea how the proofreading would happen, but he could propose the idea of proofreading at that time. And of course, as we understood more and more, that there are proofreading. So the proofreading which I am talking about is not very different in terms of a larger mechanistic way as what happens during polymerase proofreading, which I am sure all of you are quite well aware of. So the systems which are called amino acid tRNA synthetases, which are responsible for picking an amino acid and then attached to tRNA, would make errors for particularly amino acids that are very similar. So now we know that the proofreading function over the last 10 years is associated with almost half the synthetases. So which means these synthetases, amino acid tRNA synthetases, will make errors and these errors have to be corrected. So that is <clears throat> what is kind of known. Now what we know is that once an amino acid is attached to the tRNA, they are taken to the ribosome for checking the tRNA identity. However, nothing is checked in the context of what is attached to the tRNA at the ribosomal level. So which means when the elongation factor takes the amino acylated tRNA to the ribosome, they actually get to the ribosome and then release the amino acylated tRNA. And what is checked is only the codon-anticodon interaction. And this approach is now used by a lot of synthetic biology people to introduce unnatural amino acids, correct, into the tRNA. Therefore, you can actually generate proteins of the property of your interest. So that is an active area of research that is going on. However, I would like to highlight one point here. When we talk about amino acids, we are talking, you know, when I say amino acid in the context of biology or in terms of protein synthesis, you all are assuming that I am talking about the L form of amino acids. Right? We don't say it explicitly because we assume that L amino acids are the ones which are in biological system. Again, over the last 10 years, even though there were some classical examples of D amino acids in biology, like D serine and D aspartic acid are well known neurotransmitters, as some of you know. And in the bacterial cell wall, also you have D amino acids. These are very classical examples, but we ignore them as amino acids. We think of them as some chemical entities. Over the last 10 years, people have figured out that there are D amino acids, in fact, almost all of them, present in every biological system. There is no biological system without significant amount of D amino acids. And some of the D amino acid concentrations are present as high as that of the L amino acid counterpart. And they pose a problem for protein biosynthesis. Okay, so therefore, and of course, these D amino acids also do important function in the respective biological systems. I gave two examples of bacteria for cell wall and neurotransmitters in the context of higher you know, eukaryotes. But you also have the plant kingdom where T amino acids are responsible for multiple biological processes. So these are the ideas that are coming over the last 10, 15 years. Okay, so when we talk about proofreading, as I said, mechanistically, it is not that different in a larger sense compared to the polymerase proofreading. So let's say this is an amino acid activating molecule, which is called the tRNA synthetase activation domain. When it attaches the amino acid on top of the tRNA, as you all know, the tRNA ends with a CCA end, correct? That is the end of the tRNA. And the CCA is a single-stranded entity, correct? Compared to the double-stranded rigid structure of the rest of the RNA molecule. So the CCA, after accepting the amino acid, would flip to what are called these editing domains. So the editing domains are designed for binding more specifically the non cognate amino acid. Therefore, it cannot allow the larger amino acid to bind. So if you think of it from a simpler term as what Pauling originally envisaged, you have a pocket which is slightly bigger, say for example, which can bind isoleucine, valine can sneak in, or threonine's pocket in which serine can sneak in. 
However, if I have a pocket designed for serine, which is smaller, it's very difficult to force in an extra methyl group because the energy that you have to spend to activate that for the binding is much, much higher. So using this mechanism, the editing domains would bind to the non cognate amino acid or the incorrect amino acid and then would cleave. So by doing these two step process, the fidelity of the protein biosynthesis gets increased. And since this, of course, I have shown an example of an editing domain, which is covalently attached to the synthetase, as seen here, because this is part of the same protein in which it's a multi-domain protein. You have an editing domain, which does the job. You also have a lot of freestanding proofreading modules in the cell, which means they are not present as part of synthetase. They are present as individual proteins, but they come and now fetch from the elongation factor attached uh, amino acylated tRNA and check for what is the nature of the amino acid in the tRNA and then keeps correcting. So you do have what are called cis-editing domains as well as trans-editing domains in the cell across biological systems. <clears throat> this is one classic study that came from the group of uh, Susan Ackerman and Paul Schimmel uh, almost 15 years or so back. And what they showed, I mean, this is the first time where they showed the importance of proofreading domain in the context of higher systems. As we know, these are all housekeeping enzymes, so any mutation can be deleterious. Right? What they showed in the case of one of the proofreading modules, not the killing of the editing site or the editing function, even a partial compromise of the editing activity. Correct? There was a mutation which resulted in a partial compromise of the activity that can result to global misfolding and cell death leading to apoptosis and leading to cerebellar ataxia. So that kind of first time demonstrated the importance of preserving the fidelity of protein biosynthesis. <clears throat> so now I'll just tell a little bit chronologically as to why from proofreading we went towards D amino acids because we were basically interested in, at the time when I started the lab 20 years back, we were looking at variations to the common theme. Because if you look at many synthetases and look at their editing property, they would be conserved across evolution. Say, for example, if I find a proofreading module attached to a tRNA synthetase in a bacteria like E. coli, I can also say that even the human enzyme would have similar activity because these are expected to be conserved through evolution. So what we found around that time was there are some interesting variations. And in certain cases where you look for a domain which is supposed to be proofreading to a tRNA synthetase, either that domain is missing or the domain is modified to something else. So we identified long back an editing domain which was attached to a tRNA synthetase. I will not go into the detail. And when we solved the structure, because the sequence was unique, there was no alpha fold at that time. So we have to do the hard way of solving the structure by using this technique called X-ray crystallography. And when we solved the structure, and then we went to the database, protein database, to look at whether any other protein structure will be available, which will be similar to the one that we saw, just to see what we can derive from the function of those systems. If you find whatever I'm saying a little bit complicated, you can raise your hand, okay? Because some protein structural information would be coming. So here, when we look for that information, what we found was that these proteins, the fold of this protein was similar to what are called T amino acid removing enzymes from tRNA. So that was the first time I ever encountered, because I was introduced, I am coming from a physics background, correct? So I had no idea of biology when I began. We slowly started learning biology as we went along. So D amino acid, I have never encountered other than in your first few pages of biochemistry textbooks, where they say there is something called a corn law, C-O-R-N law, which is to use, which is used for identifying which is an L amino acid and which is a D amino acid, correct? The corn goes in one way, CO, R group and amino group goes in one way, you call that as CL. If it goes in the reverse way, you call that as D. Correct? So that's all we study about D amino acids, and beyond that, we don't. So I went around the CCMB as a modern biology institution, so go and talk to people and figure out. And they also had no idea as to where are D amino acids, what are you talking about? Right? Because the problem doesn't exist for most. Then we realized 
that there are molecules specifically remove DM amino acids from tRNA because many of the synthetases actually make mistakes like how they make mistakes with non cognate L amino acids like L isoleucine synthetase will put L valine on top of the tRNA. So that was a cognate L amino acid mistake, cognate non cognate. However, in these cases, there are synthetases which would put Instead of an L amino acid, it would put the D amino acid on top of tRNA, and these are enzymes that remove. So that is where the structural similarity came in. So since <clears throat> that module was present, correct, as a D amino acid removing system, present in conjunction with the tRNA synthetase, this allowed us to propose a model wherein the first protein biosynthesizing machineries would have been bugged more by putting a D amino acid, because putting a D amino acid in, in a growing polypeptide chain, as I will show, is much more detrimental for the folding of the protein and eventual functioning rather than putting a slightly different L amino acid. So, we proposed this model that how primordial synthetases could have enforced or perpetuated homochirality during the early evolution of biological life. So, <clears throat> Okay, so now I'm going to talk about mainly D amino acids, the enzymes that are responsible for, and what are their biological implications. As we all know, the D and L amino acids are nothing but mirror images of each other, correct? It's like our left and right hand. And you can actually make a model of D amino acids, and this is the classical Ramachandran plot. So if you take a protein of L amino acid, you can put a mirror to generate a D amino acid. This is the Ramachandran plot, which you must have crossed in your biochemistry textbook. The green one belongs to the L amino acid protein, where these are the forbidden areas for the L amino acid protein according to the Ramachandran's considerations. However, if you look at the D amino acid, this will be centrally inverted. Okay, so in principle, you can make a D amino acid protein. And uh, the conformation would be centrally invert, no, inverted to the L amino acid protein in the Ramachandran plot. What was shown quite some time back, almost 30 years back, this was a cover of science in which people could synthesize D amino acid proteins or D amino acid peptides chemically, because there is no biological system even today. People are making a lot of attempts to see if we can synthesize D amino acid proteins in a template driven manner, either in a cell free system or using a biological system, but the atoms are not yet that fruitful. People can generate something like a tetrapeptide, but they are trying to modify multiple components to see that whether they can biologically synthesize D amino acid proteins. But what was shown in this case of HIV protease, which became the cover as if it is a, there can be a mirror image world that can exist, is that the HIV protease, which is chemi chemically synthesized with D amino acids instead of the biological HIV protease, which is synthesized with L protein, can actually fold and also function. So there is no problem if I make a D amino acid world protein or the protein world as D amino acids. They all are will function. And the HIV protease now, instead of chewing the L amino acid peptides, will now start chewing only the D amino acid peptide. So not only the protein will become chirally inverse, the substrate also will become chiralinear. So everything will become a mirror image of the real world. However, the problem comes when you have, if you, nature, for whatever reason, we will not get into, that's open for discussion, decided to use only L amino acids. But if suddenly, if it makes mistakes with D amino acids in between, then the protein cannot fold. That's what the Ramachandran map kind of tells, that you can't switch the fold in between. You know, suddenly you can't have in the helix that a D amino acid substituted when you have an L amino acid protein or vice versa. And this has been studied also very well biophysically by putting D amino acids in between, then they are well known helix breakers. So you can't have a folded protein if I have these two. So obviously there will be misfolding and cell death. So what is happening in the cell, as I already mentioned, that there is significant amount of D amino acids present in almost all life forms. So Many synthetases make mistakes with D amino acids by putting D amino acids in a cellular scenario on top of the tRNA. And the mistakes are so high that it cannot sustain a normal uh, protein biosynthesis with a high fidelity. 
So therefore, of course, we can think of these as the first selectivity filter because most of the synthetases are quite specific, but some of them are not that specific. So this is the first kind of a chiral checkpoint in the cell, followed by <coughs> what are called the elongation factors, which bind to these amino acylated tRNAs, right, and then take them to the ribosome. The elongation factors are also quite specific for L amino acids compared to D amino acids, but they are not exclusive in the specificity, which means they can also make mistakes. This is the second chiral checkpoint in the cell, if we, you know, uh, one way of uh, calling them. The third checkpoint is that of ribosome. The ribosome also is, you know, highly effective in making L amino acid peptides in the peptidyl transferase center. And people with the ribosome structures and complexes with tRNAs, they have shown that the peptidyl transferase center also has chiral selectivity, but it is not exclusive. What I mean to say is that they can also be porous at times. So therefore, all these processes would generate significant amount of D amino acid tRNAs because they are not taken for protein synthesis. They are not incorporated into the protein. However, these D amino acid tRNAs are dead end products and they are left in the cell. And therefore, <clears throat> what happens is you have two possibilities. If they go on to get incorporated in the protein chain, you have this folding. If they don't, then you actually deplete the free tRNA pool in the cell, which means you don't have enough free tRNAs for further rounds of uh, you know, protein synthesis. Therefore, there is this protein called TTD. And one of the important, not one, there are a few important or key points of this protein is there's only one D amino acid deacylase which means there's only one protein that is responsible for taking care of all the D amino acid mistakes. We don't have 19 D amino acid deacylases for 19 D amino acids. On top of it, in addition to the amino acid, uh, you know, kind of uh, openness, it doesn't care which tRNA that comes. So therefore, there is no tRNA selection and there is no amino acid selection. So what I mean here, I can give you an example. Think of an amino acid like arginine and think of an, another amino acid like aspartic acid. Their chemistries are quite different. But this enzyme would act on both with more or less the same efficiency, which suggests that I don't care what is the chemistry of the amino acid. I am interested only in the chirality of the amino acid that is coming. So therefore, this DTD protein scans in the cell for D amino acid tRNAs and ensures that only L amino acid tRNA pool is left, whereas the D amino acids are uncoupled from the tRNA so that the tRNA can enter fresh round of translation. And therefore, <clears throat> this kind of plays a central role in this whole process of ensuring that the turnover of tRNA happens. Now, as I already told you, that there is only one D amino acid D acylase for all the 20 or 19 D amino acids. As you all know, glycine is the only amino acid which does not have the chirality. So, glycine is a care. So, there are 19 D amino acids it can take care and it can take care of diverse tRNAs. And we were interested in the mechanism as to how this protein functions long time back. Okay. 10 years or so back, or 15 years back, we started this work because the mechanism was not known. So what we did was to solve the structure. I will not take you through the technical details. One interesting feature that we saw was it is a dimeric protein and the dimeric protein shares active site between the two modules and there is something called a glycis pro motif. What, you mean, what I mean by glycis pro motif is that normally in proteins when peptide bonds are formed, what we what we have is a trans bond formation, correct? I hope if not, you go back to your biochemistry textbooks and look at what is a trans bond and what is a cis bond. So mostly we have trans bond, but sometimes we have cis bond, which is basically coming from the nature of the partial double bond of the peptide bond character, correct? Because of which the omega angle can either be zero or 180. When it is 180, we call that as trans. When it is zero, we call it as cis. So there is a glycis pro motif, which is key for the chiral recognition. And that is a central player in ensuring that the chirality of the amino acid that is coming in is picked. And therefore, we can remove very selectively the D amino acid from tRNA. This we showed long back. So just to cut a very, very long story short, this is where the mechanistic understanding stays in our lab at this point of time. 
you have pool of L amino acid, D amino acid, and of course, A chiral glycine in the cell. The L amino acid tRNA pools are never touched by DTT because naturally, so that is a challenge that the enzyme has to face, and nature has designed the enzyme in such a way that it doesn't touch the L amino acid tRNA pool. Otherwise, you are going to be detrimental to the cell because you are actually going to consume more ATP if you do that. Of course, as the name suggests, it very effectively takes care of D amino acid tRNA. What we figured out in the process is that this protein is actually rather than a D selective enzyme, it is an L rejection enzyme. So the mode of operation of this enzyme is by rejecting L amino acid. Anything but L is the mode of operation. Because of the mode of operation, this enzyme also works on glycine, which means if you have a glycine on tRNA glycine, this protein removes it quite effectively. And that is not possible because if that is hap that happens, then you don't have glycine for protein delivery. So we kind of, I'm not going into those details today. That's a separate story. There are elements in tRNA which ensures that glycine is not touched. So therefore, the glycine tRNAs have certain unique features compared to the rest of the tRNAs. And therefore, they are not acted upon. So we wondered why nature selected this protein to be acting on glycine. That was kind of question which was there for a long time. And we showed that it has additional functions in terms of working on glycine mistake, which is then it is put on tRNA alanine. So we identified certain additional functions. So this is just to summarize where we stand in terms of the mechanistic understanding. OK, so now <clears throat> let me see how this goes. So we wanted to look at uh, multiple <clears throat> evolutionary scenarios of this protein. And what I have depicted here, we looked at all the genomes in terms of the presence of the protein or the variants of the protein. We found that all bacteria have this protein called DTD1, which is what I talked about. The structure came from a plasmodium, but they are all DTD1 is from a bacterial species. And the E. coli structures are also available. The mechanism is more or less the same. However, you have a totally different protein in terms of both sequence as well as its structure in all archaeal life forms. As you all know, life possibly originated somewhere in between, correct? 3.5 or so billion years ago. So you have one DTD molecule or one form of DTD molecule in the bacterial form of life and another form of DTD molecule in the archaeal form of life. And eukaryotes are nothing but the amalgamation of an archaeal ancestor when it engulfed the bacteria which became a mitochondria. So therefore, there are a lot of gene exchanges between these when it became a eukaryote. And in eukaryotes, you have two branches. One I call that a sophistocota. This is the name which we figured out. That's how you should call fungi and animals together. So that is called aphistocons. And the plants are the plant kingdom, correct? Including the algae, we call them, you know, that has a different partition. So now when we looked at what kind of proteins that are present, there were certain variations. So one is a protein called ATD, which we named it as animalia-specific tRNA DSLAs. The reason being that it is present only in animals when we analyze the sequence. And the plants had another version called, I mean, not another version. Plants are unique in terms of having both DTD1 and DTD2. So naturally, the question is, what is this variant doing? And of course, why plants should have two versions in their genomes? Well, other life forms can sustain with only one. So these are the larger questions that we had and we set out to understand. So, so they're entirely different in terms of sequence and structure. They are totally different. So, which clearly says that they have independent origins. But there is no life form, I must emphasize, without a DTT protein in their genome, suggesting the importance of this protein's function in the cellular milieu. Okay, so <clears throat> this was basically an identification of this protein, which we call as ATD, as name suggests, is Animalia specific DSLAs. Yeah, so initially this DTD was, uh, the ATD was annotated as DTD1 or DTD2, something in the database. Basically, the reason for annotating as DTD1 or 2 was that if you look at the sequence here, they are more or less identical and the GP, which is very critical for the chirality based selection, correct, 
is also kind of invariant. So a casual look will tell you that possibly it is a parallel which has emerged. Possibly it will work. And as in you know higher systems that we see, you do have duplications of genes for various purposes. So this is what we thought for quite some time. However, a clever student in the lab by name Santosh, when he looked at very closely these sequences, what he identified, the GP is critical for chiral selection. While the GP is invariant in these animalia specific molecules, the residues that are keeping them intact. So this is something which you may have to look at when you are looking for mutations of functionally important genes, that it is not just the key residues alone, which can possibly give rise to phenotype, but also variations around certain key residues. If you have some structural information with alpha pole that you can look at, can throw interesting light. So what he figured out was, while the active site residues, if I may call that way, which are highly conserved, are invariant, but the residues that were holding the active site residues, he found some variation. Since the GP motif was central to the selection of chirality, he suspected that there must be something happening to the GP motif. So we had no clue at that time, but we knew that there is something interesting happening. So we solve the structure of the protein. Of course, it is just to show that GP motif is invariant, sorry. And as you can see the organisms here, so ATD kind of protein is not present in any other organisms other than animals. So we solve the structure and I hope this movie runs. Great. So this is ATD for you, which binds around the chiral center. You know, the chiral center is nothing but the C alpha of the amino acid. So it binds around. Now, when we solve the structure of the protein, while the rest of the protein structure was more or less identical, the GP motif, as we just saw, maybe it will come back, it flipped from a glycis pro motif to a glytrans pro motif. So by having that kind of a shift, what it does is to create an extra space around, which clearly tells that the chiral selectivity now would be gone because there is no more chiral selectivity in this molecule because GP is not in the same orientation. However, since that space is generated, possibly it can act on some small L amino acids is what we proposed from the structure. This would not have been possible by a simple modeling approach. So experimental structure is important for us to appreciate the fact that certain subtle changes can happen. OK, so this, of course, is more clearer here. So this is the GP motif when it is capturing the chirality of the D amino acid. And as you can see here, the GP has shifted completely from a cis pro to a trans pro motif, thereby generating some amount of spaces around. As I just mentioned, you see the rest of the protein structure is nearly identical. So that is the only change that has happened in the context of animals, wherein a new paralog has been generated, possibly for a different function. So this is what the structure told us. And that's how the difference is. We will not go into the details. And the structure is coming from a mouse variant. So again, I'm going to cut a long story short here. So if you look at from the original idea of proofreading that was proposed by Linus Pauling and followed by several others, including us, in terms of understanding the proofreading mechanisms during protein biosynthesis, they're all centered on amino acid mistakes which means the tRNA synthetase is highly selective for the tRNA. It doesn't make mistakes for tRNA selection because the tRNA is a larger molecule. Therefore, there are many binding determinants that the molecule can set itself. So I can pick the tRNA quite effectively. So the mistakes that were noted were majorly in the context of picking the wrong amino acid but putting it on the correct tRNA. So this is what we all have studied in the field for nearly 40, 50 years, correct? However, what we showed here is a mistake in terms of tRNA. Where is it coming from? So if you look at the number of tRNAs, as we can naively think, there are only 20 uh, you know, tRNA synthetases or 20 amino acids to be carried to the ribosome. So the tRNA number would be around a few tens. But when you go from a bacteria to yeast to higher systems, the number of tRNAs go from few tens to few hundred to few thousands. So there is a significant genome expansion that has happened in the context of animals, wherein the number of tRNA genes for doing more or less the same job has expanded to few hundred to few thousand. So since the tRNA is a 
relatively larger molecule, but it has only 76 nucleotides. So how much of variation that you can actually put in in the tRNA molecule? Therefore, the cross reaction with synthetases starts happening. So what we showed in this case here is the synthetase picks up the correct amino acid, but it puts on the wrong tRNA. So the tRNA here, of course, is a tRNA threonine, which during genome expansion has gotten some identity determinants. I will not go into the details, which are similar to that of the alanyl tRNA. So in that process, there was a tRNA misselection that has happened. So the alanyl tRNA synthetase picks up alanine correctly, but puts on top of tRNA threonine, and this error has to be corrected. And there is a clear correlation between the appearance of this protein ATD and where we actually find the error-prone species of tRNA. So if I find in a genome of animalia, animalia if I find this tRNA, which is error-prone, I will find the ATD. If I don't find the ATD, in other, in other words, you will not find this tRNA. So there is a one-on-one -on -one correlation. So the larger question that we are asking at this point of time is why would nature create a problem and solve the need then and there? Because it's very counterintuitive, correct? Right? Why do you want to introduce a mutation and then correct it? So the current understanding that we are trying to have, current hypothesis that we have, that many of these tRNAs are used for generating fragments and the tRNA's non-canonical function in the cell are also coming to the fore. Correct? The many tRNA-derived fragments, short tRNA-derived fragments, are used for multiple biological processes. And therefore, we think this could be a way of routing set of tRNAs away from translation so that you can use those tRNAs for other functions. So we are now having ATD knockout model systems in which we are looking for enriched tRNAs. But what was more interesting, what I Wait, wanted, sir, I I'm coming there. So that was the most exciting thing for us. So, okay, before I should uh, yeah, just get there, uh, we just wanted to say that all that we showed before was purely biochemical. We didn't show the importance of this molecule in the context of uh, biological system. So what we did was to knock out this protein initially, both in mice and then in cell lines, and we didn't see any impact. So this was puzzling. Why you should have a protein which is quite well conserved in the whole of animalia as a paralog of TTD, but have no function when I knock it out. So this was really puzzling. Then what we figured out was that when we had this knockout and then we subject these cells under certain stress, particularly oxidative stress in this case, we found that the ATD knockout cells had much severe phenotype, which it was not giving in the context of without stress. So this is the MTT assay. I will not go into details for all these. We showed it in multiple cell types, including in ES cells, that the ATD knockout proteins normally are fine, but if you subject them to oxidative stress, they are much more susceptible than the normal cells. <clears throat> we showed using, you know, how what are the kind of defects that happen, and the defects are majorly because of protein unfolding, and you see aggregation. So what we did was a reporter where the protein is a highly sensitive protein, so it cannot tolerate to mutations, which is a GFP reporter as, you know, attached, and showed in the cellular scenario that the, when the cells are under stress, now you suddenly have aggregation. That doesn't happen in the wild type scenario, suggesting the importance of ATD in the context of stress. Now, why would that happen? I think I had that before, but let me tell you, uh, why would that happen? Because there was a canonical synthetase, which was taking care of this particular problem in the cellular scenario. During oxidative stress, there was a cysteine in the active site of that protein, which was inactivated. So therefore, it cannot do the job. So there is some redundancy that is set in the cellular scenario for error correction, which was killed during oxidative stress, which the ATD was taking care of. So as Partho asked, the question is, when did it happen? Because I was saying it is animalia-specific protein. So when in the animalia branch of life, nature has evolved this parallel was the natural question that we asked. So that took us to these interesting organisms called cyanoflagellates. So there's a lady by name Nicole King, who is a pioneer in this area, who goes all around, collects samples from, you know, God forsaken places, wherever. And she takes those 
you know, collect sample and come back and characterize what kind of molecule or what kind of organisms that are thriving in those systems. And particularly, she is interested in these kind of flagellates. And she has now even set up a kind of flagellate, uh, what you call ability to do genetics in kind of flagellates, which we are all looking forward to testing at some point of time because these are very difficult systems to work with. Why kind of flagellates? Why she is inter she was interested in kind of flagellate in the first place? These are unicellular ancestors of the multicellular life forms like us. However, there are processes that we think which are only multicellular are responsible for multicellularity in higher life forms. Part of them have already been rooted in the ancestors of them. It's not that suddenly all the factors of multicellularity appeared in a multicellular life form. So this is the beauty of another way of looking at the genomic analysis. While you guys are mostly interested in looking at from a disease point of view, this other thriving area now where people are actually sequencing a lot of intermediates in the evolution of life forms. So by looking at these intermediates in the evolution of life forms and see how processes have evolved over a period of time, correct? what kind of processes have come in even before actually the phenotype has emerged. So these are unicellular flagellates. But when you put under different stress, they come together in different ways. Depending on the stress, they come in different ways together and act as multicellular life form. They are not multicellular though. They are coming together, resembles a multicellular life form. That's why they are called unicellular ancestors of multicellularity. Of course, in I don't remember exactly the number. I would be wrong there. There are at least 60 different independent evolutionary events of multicellular life forms across you know whatever life forms that we see the multicellularity has appeared in life in 60 different ways so we are only one of them okay so when she looks at all these she identifies these processes and what when we looked at where the trna that gave rise to this error as well as when the atd arose we find them at the level of kind of flagellates where the origins of multicellularity are set in. And that is where you have this huge genome expansion of tRNA. That, of course, genome expansion, huge genome expansion happens followed by the tRNA expansion, which also happens. And there is a one on one correlation between the presence of ATD and the error, error kind of creating tRNA together in the, at the level of kind of flagellates. So, just to summarize this, work, what we showed was that there's a huge genome expansion, which is followed by tRNA expansion that creates tRNA ambiguity for selection instead of the normally known amino acid ambiguity. And that creates this mistake. Okay. And therefore, a canonical enzyme in the context of multicellularity, which is supposed to be correcting the error in other life forms, is made inactive because multicellularity is known to have multicellular life forms are known to have higher oxidative stress than free living because they accumulate oxidative stress but since molecules are and the cells are together and this is a well known phenomenon and therefore since this molecule is rendered inactive you have an appearance of atd which eventually solves the problem without which you have serious mistranslation leading to cell death so that is what we showed so currently our working hypothesis is that possibly the reason for the appearance of the error as well as the error correcting system together is to redirect these tRNAs for non-canonical functions which are now coming to the fore in, a, you know, in multiple uh, physiological scenarios. So just to summarize this work, so what we showed is this genomic innovation of ATD in the context of, you know, Animalia is responsible for possibly inducing multicellularity. Okay, so I'm switching gears. Uh, I have 10 minutes. Ten, yeah, okay, so the next, so I talked about this protein called ATD. So now I will be talking about this protein by name DTD2. So as I said, the DTD1 is of bacterial origin, the DTD2 is of plant origin. The interest came to us because why? Only plant should have both DTDs, where everything, everywhere else you can survive with only one DTD molecule. So, when we before even we began the work, one interesting observation that was there when people did you know transposon based mutagenesis, 
a screening arabidopsis. What they figured out was the DTD2. DTD2 is nothing but a protein or an enzyme which removes D amino acids from tRNA. That's all. And that was giving resistance to both ethanol and acetaldehyde. Knockout is fine, but if you put them under ethanol or acetaldehyde, these are all byproducts of anaerobic fermentation that happens in plants. Particularly, as you know, the plants are rooted and obviously you have anaerobic conditions there. So basically, they go through anaerobic fermentation. And the anaerobic fermentation produces eventually ethanol, but it goes through the process of acetaldehyde. So acetaldehyde concentrations in the cell go up, particularly in certain conditions like in the pollen or in the roots to a very high level. And what they showed was the DTD protein, for some reason, was kind of high DTD knockout uh, system, was highly sensitive to ethanol and acetaldehyde, which was surprising to us because we know the biochemical function of the protein is something else in proofreading. Where is the sensitivity coming in? So this took us a long time because hypo, what kind of hypothesis you can make by linking these two processes. So one that came to our head is possibly the acetaldehyde is known to make modifications and they make adducts. So we had no clue where this adduct would be made. Maybe the adduct is forming on the amino acylated tRNA and therefore the DTD protein possibly is removing these adducts from the tRNA, thereby kind of ameliorating or reducing the stress. So that was our hypothesis. And again, of course, when you have an adduct on these tRNAs, they are not good for translation. So you will have translation arrest, that's, therefore the cell dies. So our proposal was that DTD2 helps in recycling these adduct-based tRNAs. So then it took quite some time for us because treating or handling acetaldehyde and then doing biochemistry is one of the trickiest which we learned over a period of time. So we actually did a lot of experiments to eventually show that acetaldehyde indeed forms adducts on tRNA. And these adducts are called ethyl adducts, right? So basically there is an ethyl modification that happens on top of the tRNA, which is not on the tRNA's amino group on the adenosine, but it is on the amino group of the amino acid attached to the tRNA. Therefore, you form what are called N-ethyl D-amino acid adducts, which we call them as NEDAC. And the DTD1 protein cannot handle this job. Whereas the DTD2 protein can do this job of removing adducts from, uh, you know, the tRNA. Is that tRNA that not found in the animal kingdom? No, because you don't have such kind of acetaldehyde stress that comes into the, you know. Okay, so the activity of DTD2, we call that as need at activity. And again, we did the same approach. I'm just trying to present the work in a different way for this audience. So whatever we kind of asked is a question from a genomic comparison information, like how we asked the question for ATD, we asked a similar question in the context of DTD2 as to when did plants acquire DTD2? Because these are also exciting times in the plant area where they are now sequencing a lot of genomes which are land plant ancestors or flowering plant ancestors. Correct. So how flowering occurred, correct? because that is a much later adaptation. The same way the life was in water for a very long time. The first organisms to move out of water, as you may all know, is plants. Then the animals followed the plants. Correct. So the migration of terrestrialization, as people technically call, the terrestrialization of plants which were in the water, is a larger process and there are multiple genes that were acquired by land plant ancestors before they became actually land plants. So that is what we wanted to look at as to when did plants acquire DTD2. And as I just said, by analyzing genome sequences, genome sequences of these ancestors of many of these biological processes or life forms that we see, people have come with multiple scenarios of cellular processes which have already rooted before the plants itself. So that means whatever we think are plant specific characters, they are not just with the plants, but they are with the ancestors of plants. And these are some of the processes that I have listed, but there is nothing of archaeal origin because as I told you, DDD2 is coming from archaea because it is not present in the bacterial version. Okay, so <clears throat> 
just to summarize this, what we found was that, as I said, DTD2 is an RKL version. It is not present in bacteria. It is not present in cyanobacteria. Therefore, it could not have come from anywhere. All the earlier, you know, the plant branch, correct as we call as Archiplastida, none of the algae have this. And here is where the caropoids come and the land plant ancestors are these uh, entities like chlorophybus and Klebsarmidium. Even in caropoids, there is a mesostigma which is not subaerial. Only the chlorokybus actually started venturing to land, whereas mesostigma is not. So what we found was that there is a direct transfer. I wouldn't say direct transfer. There is a transfer because archaea is not, not, not known to transfer genes to higher eukaryotes because it does not have all the systems, whereas bacterial gene transfers are well known in a horizontal manner. So there is this archaeal gene which has been acquired by a land plant ancestors around 800 million years ago in the context of chlorokypus. That's what we know based on the available genome sequences of all these land plant ancestors. And most of them were sequenced only in the last few years, correct? Because of the genome sequencing, you know, the easiness with which we can do genome sequencing. So then you find them all across the board, suggesting that it is a land plant specific adaptation. And that's indeed what we propose that to when plants move from water to land, you have serious anaerobic stress. And to counter this anaerobic stress, you need to have such molecules which will help them in de-stressing the adapted forms. And just to summarize uh, this part of the story of DTD2, you know, when you think of this migration of an archaeal protein all the way to caraphytes, what are the requirements? One, we talked about anaerobic stress that happens in the soil. The other thing which we noted is the soil is filled with a lot of microbial degradation. And this is something which is now known for I mean, almost 10 years. When people analyze different soil samples, you have significant amount of D-amino acids because the microbes themselves produce a lot of them. And therefore, the soil is enriched with lot of D-amino acids. So the confluence of excess D-amino acids in the soil in which the rooting system has to form, as well as the anaerobic stress that they have to go through, necessitates a protein like DTD2 to be there to solve the problem of de-stressing, which the DTD1 cannot do. In water resident plants? The current day water resident plants, all of them have DTD2. No, uh, the, the mesostigma upwards. No, they, none of them have DTD2. No so, homologous genes as well. No homologous genes as well. But they all have DTD1 because all these branches have DTD1, they do not have DTD2. So I'm just wondering where did, how did DTD2? So that is a question that we are asking now. See, there are two possibilities which we are thinking. One is that there is this cyanobacteria have something called DTD3. Okay, that's another version which is of independent origin. So that DTD3 is a very difficult gene to identify because this is highly homologous to some DNA binding proteins called TAD-D. I don't know what exactly the function of that is. But those proteins, and if you look at the DTD3 sequence, it, unless otherwise you do the biochemistry, we can't identify because they are from the genome sequence. If you find, you have most residues which are highly conserved. So therefore, we have to now take them and look at, and there are multiple copies of them in these organisms. So we have to look at whether you have a DTD3 in these organisms or do they solve a different problem? The other hypothesis that we can easily make is that maybe these organisms don't have the problem of D amino acids and rooting as much. And therefore, there is no need for a gene like DTD2 to be present. Uh, can I complete or you want to uh, you, you want to ask a question? No, no, it's fine. Yeah. So currently you are favoring the hypothesis that there was horizontal transfer to these uh, land-based plants and then it evolved. Uh, exactly. Over a so period. the land plant ancestors acquired several key changes, correct? It's not DTD2 only made them to be a land plant. There are several changes that were happening. And this is one of the key events that has happened. for a group. This, is, this is published. I don't know where the publication is missing here. Somewhere it is hidden. Hmm? I am not going into the detail. This is very all the publications are hidden by this task bar. So you guys have to go and figure out where we have published. <laughs> so this is a very recent work, but I am not going into the uh, details. Uh, 
the other thing which we have done this year which was kind of interesting for all of us is with respect to the glycine issue that i was telling so the bacteria solves the problem of glycine in one way and the archaea solves the problem of glycine in another way now if you think of an eukaryote which emerged 2 billion years ago is nothing but an archaeal ancestor which which we also know from genome sequences that which archaea which became a eukaryote they call it as lokia archaea and we also know which bacteria or which bacterial clade gave rise to mitochondria that is nothing but rickettsia the clade that is closer to rickettsia which gave rise to the mitochondria that we are dealing with so an engulfment of a lokia archaea of a rickettsial clade bacteria and when you think of these two larger systems that have evolved for 2 billion years independently when they come together to make a life form of course there are many canonical processes they will work together but for many cellular processes there will be certain components which will be at cross purposes which means what this guy makes this guy will anneal and what this guy makes that guy will anneal so i cannot integrate and make a cellular network for a particular process and that is exactly what we saw that a protein of coming from bacteria when it goes to the archaeal correct cytoplasm which is the eukaryotic cytoplasm it will be with cross purpose and how cellular integration happens during protein biosynthesis by modifying these components so that we can integrate or how nature has integrated them to become a successful eukaryote is what we showed in a recent work particularly with respect to protein biosynthesis so what it tells us is that during the amalgamation if you look at these genes and processes i am talking about only one process but there are hundreds of processes that are at the cell right which now one has to see as to what kind of you know cross purposes would be there and what kind of changes would have come during this amalgamation process during eukaryotic is what we suggested that these are things which need to be looked at so just to <clears throat> conclude so what i have shown you is that these chiral proofreading molecules are involved in multiple critical steps as i said about multicellularity land plants and also mitochondria which they played a key role in the evolution of these life forms and it kind of strengthens the view that people have in the field at least from a protein structural biology point of view that if you know there are certain folds that are highly enriched in the genomes correct if you take some canonical folds of 8 to 10 type they are present almost something like 30 to 40% of the proteins that we see because nature uses them again and again because they have found a very stable fold now they can employ it for multiple purposes the same way we are now thinking this is just an idea i am throwing out for this audience that maybe there are certain genes that are present correct which are used at critical times and what we also know from the literature is that the more ancient the protein is or more abundant the protein is they perform moonlighting function right as we know the same way the more ancient proteins which are there are preserved in some form or there is a memory and they are called for for doing certain function where the memory is whether it is in the dna sequence protein sequence or epigenetic modification or chromosomal location is for anybody's guess but that's a very open area as to why certain molecules are called for very very key events in life forms is it because they are just ancient and if that is the case where is that memory loaded for nature to recover is a very open question that i have at this point okay so i would like to conclude by acknowledging all the people who are involved in the work a relatively larger group as somebody pointed out something around 10 15 days and most of the work i described today are the work of jyoti Majid, who should be somewhere here. Both of them, Majid has gone out. Jyotin is part of going out, and Pradeep here, and with help from several others. And I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Any questions? Feel free. Uh, very nice subject. Should be very enjoyed. All the evolution subjects. Anyone question? Uh, part of these biological subjects.
do you have any information on data? I mean, that, that expression of the entity, particular to use the physical data, or it can express in a sensory integration of it. Just by curiosity. Of what, if a hot from emergency perspective, as an immune or potential defense perspectives. Yes, I, to be very honest, I have absolutely no clue. But oh, you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are free to look at it. But I, I, to be honest, I have no idea. So I can't even comment. But you know, there are there is a link here because the gut microbiome. Yeah, correct? Yeah, gut microbiome, people have seen that some of these bacteria can actually produce the amino acids and they can be secreted in the environment. There's some sporadic papers here and there. Now, if they modulate certain immune response, because of which the DTT protein inside will have some issue or how it is being, you know, looked at by the environment of the gut microbiome, I have no idea. But that's something which can be looked at. See, this area itself is very, very, right. Right. because not many people are looking at the function of the amino acids. Correct? So when I started, I can tell you, 20 years back, some of the veterans told me you are working on an irrelevant problem. Okay, I said, so be it. <laughs> At least it's important to me. But now we have demonstrated the importance of this for a larger audience. So you will see in books these aspects which will be covered very, very shortly, including the basic biochemistry textbooks, role of D-amino acids in biology, and how protein biosynthesis kind of are what we have introduced as a term called chiral checkpoints or chiral proofreading ensures that the D-amino acids don't enter the protein synthesis. This is an aspect which is completely underappreciated 10 years, but now nobody tells me. <laughs> you, you know the free advice that comes, correct, Partha? <laughs> so you have to be convinced, correct? Even if the idea of people think it is rubbish and keep pushing, as long as you have some strong basis. See, our, our, again, I can tell you this, why you, know, you can't have a misplaced notion. The real grounding or belief that I had followed by my group members who kind of took this idea is the following. If there is a protein or a function which is conserved across life form and there is no life form which does not have this protein, the problem is solved. As I said, you have two independent you know, evolution of life. One is an archaeal form and a bacterial form. Both of them have different versions. They have solved the problem differently, which means there is an utmost requirement for having that, there is no, you know, if you go back to Luca of these, they will have a DTD, without which they can't emerge. So the conservation of this protein across life forms was our key, that they should be doing something important, otherwise they should not be, why they should be conserved. Yeah, Partha, please. Uh, three quick questions. One, one, by, one by one, one by one. one. one, one. 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 Yeah. Uh, I encountered the word e chiral. What did that mean? So e chiral is an interesting question again. Uh, glycine is a chiral, correct? So what it means is there are, uh, you know, the side chain of glycine is nothing but a H hydrogen. So when you have two groups attached to the chiral carbon, which is C alpha, it will become now H. So you can actually, you know, have the same entity. You don't have to look at a mirror image form. So that is why we call that as a chiral glycine. I had a very interesting question from chemistry. If some of you were chemistry oriented a little bit. He asked me, you know, there is something called a chiral glycine. I was puzzled because whatever we learned was, uh, no, chiral glycine, sorry. Glycines are a chiral. So he asked me, you know, there's something called chiral glycine. This is what the chemists do. What they put is instead of hydrogen, they put a D there. Deuterium. And then that becomes uh, a chiral entity. So when he asked me the context long back, I was perplexed. <laughs> So that but is my next like, two questions that we did. One is that you said that for your favorite hypothesis is that those horizons will transfer and then can reach uh, DCD2. Of course, when uh, plants became land, a uh, land based uh, plant kingdom, uh, lots of genes that you said flowering plants, but all of them could not have been uh, transferred horizontally. There must have been evolution from water based. So, this is one where you think that uh, horizontal transfer took place. Absolutely. That's absolutely fine. Now, if you look at uh, you know the evolution of this DTT2 gene, we find just by sequence analysis or sequence comparison, we find that there is a strong impact of natural, positive natural selection there. Has anybody done that? 
I don't think or, so. Or, or is it just complete? Um, there's no sequence variation uh, in DPD across the various organisms where DPD two is present. Okay, so let me just touch upon what you asked first. That in terms of genes which are coming in, in terms of innovation, I put a table, maybe I rush through. So what is known across the board is many of the genes that are responsible for emergence of a new life form do not happen only at that level. They happen even before. So which means the rudimentary pieces are already, you know, nature is already playing with these processes. And of course, when it becomes that life form, which it is intended for, right? Then you also have certain innovations that happen at that time. So you don't find them in the ancestors. So you have bacterially acquired proteins, you have archaea acquired proteins, you have the ones that have appeared at the level of when the eukaryogenesis happened, correct? Which also contribute, and also at the level of that organism, which are very unique. All of them together contribute to the emergence of a particular life form. So that is first. Now the positive selection of DTD2, I do not know how you will look at from a sequence point of view, because these proteins are highly conserved and they go through the normal, as far as we have checked, that if I take any other housekeeping gene and then look at what is their sequence homology across life form and what is the evolutionary, you know, the taxonomy. If I look at, they follow the same branch. Whether any positive reinforcement has happened inside, I do not. This so, is, a, uh, is there, there non-sequence variation in DT2 and DT2 across organisms? Of course there is, but this variation is what we see with every other gene. Right. Yeah. But, but I don't know whether any specific selection that has happened, that kind of analysis we have. That, that, that's easily doable because from the sequence data you can uh, identify whether you know that has been the positive selection or not, or whether it's just drifting usually. That that's possible to do. I mean, you look at the DNA side, is it? You just look at the DNA sequence. Maybe yeah, I can talk to you on that yeah. because we haven't done that. That's an interesting way yeah. of looking at that. It. Now, I actually don't know about evolution of life form, <laughs> but species don't evolve this way. There's been some amount of horizontal gene transfer in speciation, sure. but speciation does not. It's a different ball game. Very so this is like jumping the genus is what we are talking about. Yeah, yeah completely agree. So again, you know, I don't, I don't want to give the impression to the students, particularly that this is not a one gene process. Correct. This may be a key event and may be essential. But you have multiple essential events that make a life form. And this is one of the key events is what we have proposed. And without which life is at cross purposes. That has been seen. Because if you take the plant example, there is an anaerobic respiration and there is a D-amino acid environment. That is a given. So which means the toxicity of ethanol and acetaldehyde is a given. Now for the land plants to thrive, you need to have this protein. But that protein alone will not make a land plant. You need to have another hundred modifications for different purposes. That's what I mean. Yeah, please see that. Yeah. So, DM uh, acids uh, in, in a protein that has only DM acids, why does the DM acid, uh, you know, prevent the protein folding? I think the answer was there when you said uh, it's a helix breaker, right? Yes. But what if it's in in, in random region, random fire regions? Can it tolerate? Yeah, hey, so absolutely. So they are not breakers like having one, you know, particular substitution, but these are not mutational substitutions. Correct. Right? See, the errors that are introduced are highly random and stochastic. So when you have these pool of tRNAs, correct, right, which carry D amino acid in addition to L amino acid, who is going to be put on which place is anybody's guess. Correct. Right? So when you have more number of these D amino acid tRNAs, or even the errors for that matter, the example that I showed you of Paul Schimmel's work in which he showed that a mutation or a compromise of editing activity can result to neurodegeneration is because you have statistical proteins which have errors. Now they all have, because of their unfolding, they create ER stress, correct? Because the substitutions, if you look at, they are not fine substitutions. So in a protein, in one place, an isolation can be mutated to valine. In the next protein, maybe another isoleucine is mutated to valine. So you have a set of statistical proteins which do not fold that well. I hope I'm getting across the point. These are not targeted substitutes. The same way with D amino acid, you do not know where the D amino acid substitution is going to happen. Say, for example, if a D amino acid were to be substituted in a region 
half a protein, which is neither essential for its activity nor essential for its structural integrity that will survive. That protein will survive. It doesn't it's not a rule that a D will break the... No, no, it is not a rule at all. Correct. So basically, the protein conformational space you see, that's why I showed the Ramachandran uh, map, wherein you can actually have substitution. And you correctly pointed out that if you have, if you have loops, correct, they can actually have flexible conformation. So, so there if you go, you know, luckily, if you go there as a substitution, nothing will happen to that protein. That's what I meant. So you are correct in pointing that out. Maybe, maybe a larger question uh, I have here is that why at all the, the nature has to look at the analysis of what is the basic fundamental reason for this that we want to L? Why are we L, 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 L and not D? Is that what you are asking? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. If you can find the answer, I'm sure next year's Nobel Prize is with you. <laughs> okay, so I will give you what is known. So we talked about two issues here. There are two issues linked to what I talked about. One is what I talked about is just perpetuation of homochirality, which means nature has fixed that we are going to have L amino acid system. Every system that we have, correct, in the cell is fine-tuned for working with L amino acids. Therefore, D amino acids have to be excluded because you can't mix, as I said. I'm, I'm going there. Okay, so that is the first step. So what we are talking about is an issue of perpetuation. So once nature has fixed that this is the direction to take, there are multiple players that perpetuate homochirality, including the protein that I talked about. But there is an issue, which is much larger issue called origin of homochirality. The origin of homochirality deals with the issue of why we have D amino, why we have L amino acid protein world and why we have D amino acid sugar world. With all the DNA that you deal with, the riboses are basically D sugars. Okay. There were some interesting connections other than funny theories all around, correct? Including intelligent design, if you want to call. If people do not know intelligent design, I think as a biology student, you should all go back and study and ensure that you take it away from your head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the I don't know how many of you know about intelligent design. And not, not you. <laughs> Okay, so this was, I mean, there was enough controversy around, I'm sure Partha is well aware of, including in the US, people started teaching intelligent design in schools, and that became a very serious issue. So there is no intelligent design anywhere in the biological context. Okay, so I think as biology students, you should figure out what it is. Wikipedia will tell you a lot, but don't think there is an intelligent design. There is absolutely no intelligent design in anything that happens in life. Okay, so coming back to origin of homochirality, origin of chirality, so you have this DNA with uh, L D ribose and uh, proteins with L amino acids. There's one experimental paper coming again from Paul Schumann, which I thought was very fantastic. This is a one page paper in Nature he published long back with the Japanese guy. <clears throat> what they showed was. If you take D ribose, correct, as an you know as a ATP molecule, correct? You take a D ribose entity and start doing the so-called amino acylation reaction chemically, they have a slight enrichment of binding L amino acids. Getting, you know, the L amino acids have a slightly higher preference for getting activated. The same way he showed that if I take L ribose, correct? as a starting entity, and then now do the same reaction with both L and D, the Ds have, the D amino acids have a slightly higher preference. So this is the origin of that selection. But we don't know how that was perpetuated. That's what we are looking at. Now the point is, we are now, this has become a chicken and egg problem. I am now taking the origin of protein to the origin of ribose. So who decided the origin of ribosis? So it's a still an open kind of a question. And then of course there are explanations starting from you know adherence to the clay and there are papers correct even now we can see once in a while that your material sample is collected and they analyze that you do have uh, d amino acids enriched there or d riboses enriched there l riboses enriched there then they say there is a, always a possibility of a different life form which could be a mirror image life form there's nothing that stops a mirror image life form. okay okay one more point i want to add since we touched the origin of chirality issue, 
is that if you go back to this Miller Urey and Miller experiment, which I am sure all of you must have studied, the Urey Miller experiment lists you in wherever you see lists of amino acids, correct, including glycine by using very rudimentary chemical elements. Now, the Spark experiment, if you now analyze, people have analyzed even now, correct, one more time the same experiment because they had the original part, the PNAS paper in which they had reanalyzed the original sample of urea and bitter, and they found that when they say amino acid, you have equal presence of both L and D. So the chemical-based distinction is not there. It's only the biological systems have perpetuated this chirality. The chemical systems cannot distinguish. So the synthesis from abiotic material of amino acids is, you know, cannot be selective in chiral enrichment. Somewhere I saw a hand. Yes, yeah. And so it's really interesting. Uh, so, um, First question is, uh, you say that BDD works with uh, rejection of anything other than L. So, uh, but you also mentioned that there are some functional D amino acids in bacteria like tricerine and so on. So, in that case, how does BDD work? So, uh, it finds uh, an amino acid which is uh, not L. And, uh, okay, so let me try to understand your question and rephrase it a little bit. So what I possibly would have said, the mechanism by which DTD operates is through L chiral rejection, which means yeah. it should not bind L amino acids because yes. that will be, you know, kind of self-destructive. Is that clear? Yeah. Well, it cannot work. So there are two ways of designing this enzyme. So when we published that mechanistic paper, one of the reasons why people liked it is if you think of a D-amino acid DSLase, as the name suggests, you would think that this protein would go and bind specifically D-amino acid. Correct? The enzyme will have specificity for D-amino acid and remove. But that is not the way it operates. It operates by only rejecting L. Okay? So that is why now the glycine can enter. Because the glycine is neither D nor L. You understand? Yeah. Since I am working on only L rejection mode, the glycine becomes porous to this. Is that, that, that was the mechanistic proposal. So now what was the next question which followed? That you have D amino acids in the cell. Yes. Which are functional in um, bacteria, like you mentioned, D serine. Yes, uh, yeah, these are not D serine. D serine and D aspartic acids are well known neurotransmitters in the context of higher systems. You do have in the cell wall of uh, bacteria uh, amino acids like D ala and D blue and so on and so forth. So, what I was trying to emphasize is that the information that D amino acids are biological was present for a very long time. This is not a new information, including 60s and 80s, people knew that the amino acids are there, but never we looked at them as, you know, confusing the protein biosynthesis machinery. We consider them as chemical entities. There is one. Yeah, just I want to add one more thing. You may find a lot of D amino acid peptides, correct, in the context of certain bacterial systems. There are D amino acid peptides that are made. But these are all made in a non-ribosomal way. The ribosomal pathway cannot take D amino acids at all because there are multiple checkpoints as I showed you. And those D amino acid peptides are synthesized by what are called non-ribosomal peptide synthesis. So what they, they are called NRPS system. They are huge macromolecular machines. So each protein, correct, each enzyme there in that huge molecule would bind one D amino acid and put it in the molecule, you know, in the chain. So that is how they make one by one the D amino acid peptides which are used in those bacteria. They are called NRPS, non-ribosomal peptide synthase systems. But if um, the D amino acid is present in the cell wall of the bacteria, so does that mean those uh, proteins are uh, synthesized outside the... No, no, D amino acids that are present in the cell wall, so the... D amino acids like neurotransmitters are free D amino acids. I hope that is yeah. And there are many free D amino acids available. The D amino acids in the cell wall are not in the peptide form. Oh. Okay, you actually make a chain, correct, with a couple of amino acids, but they come through this non ribosomal mode.
horizontal gene transfer or DTP2. So why not? Uh, it can also evolve independently in uh, plants, right? I mean, uh, so we we know that there are several uh, molecules which have evolved independently sure. over the course of time. So uh, is there a, uh, any particular reason that you emphasize on? So, uh, you know, I'm not supposed to be giving this answer in the sense that nobody knows why it has happened. But I can look at it very differently. You know, there are things which were available, correct? In the system, say for example, in the back, the archaea that we figured out as a methanogenic archaea, which transferred this gene to the plant, was coexisting with the plants in the ecosystem. Getting the point. So when these molecules or these organisms are next door, right? There is a possibility of getting it through a horizontal gene transfer. You don't generate a new protein because you don't have that kind of evolutionary time frame. I'm just guessing this. What we see is what has happened. Correct? Why that nature has not evolved a new gene and why it acquired something is anybody's guess. And as I also mentioned as an answer earlier, that, that nature does not solve a problem one more time in a very hard way when I can already <coughs> figure out a solution using the existing resources. The classic example is that of folds, as I was saying. There are certain folds, correct? There are certain sequences that are used for multiple functions. The classic one is what is called a Tim barrel fold, correct? If you look at the Tim barrel sequence in the Tim barrel fold, that is one of the highly represented, you know, sequences in the any genome database, starting from bacteria all the way to humans. Why is it used? Because it is a rigid structure, and in that structure, I can modify just the surface residues and impart very, very, very different functions. So when I can do that, I don't want to reinvent a new fold. Because inventing a new fold for the system is much more costlier. So I use the available resource if I can. So that's how evolution works. We can discuss that later. Yeah, why nature has invented it like that is anybody's guess. Yes, that, that was an interesting part. The last question. Mm -hmm. so, the question is very different. Very clear. Right? Uh, so we have a set here. So set. Selenosis. So, uh, the setting uh, actually is replaced by cysteine as well as cysteine. So, what's the process of the protein? Mm. Uh, in that scenario, the DTD fails to act. DTD will not come into picture, they are all L type. So all these L types, DTD will never touch. So, that operates through a totally different mechanism and modification. This is the work of Dieter Saad. Correct, which has shown over a long period of time why sec as cell phone system which was required. So they because it's a L cell phone system. I think there was a hand here. Yeah, yeah. I'm at your disposal. Or are they using Thank you all. Anybody who was there in the online, thank you. You don't want to. One point five and then one point five. Okay, great. <laughs>